Aha, there we are. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Thursday night, where we are going to slide right back in to no coins, please. We are up to, I believe, chapter eight. Chapter eight. Now, when we left off, right, that's right. It was just after the milk thing and Dennis and Rob had finally found out what Artie has been up to this whole time. And Rob was having bad dreams about it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, moving on, chapter eight. The Denver Twist. With Rob at the wheel, the group headed off for their next stop, Denver. As he drove, his anger swelled, and he was unable to contain himself any longer. All right, Geller, this is it. You're rich, aren't you? Admit it. You're rich. Of course not, said Artie. Well, then, how much money do you have? Who can tell? It must be a fortune. What's money these days? Look, said Rob, I'm not an idiot. You were charging people a dollar a crack to milk those cows and you processed thousands of customers. Artie looked blank. Who's counting? Well, how much money did you make? Rob persisted. Not much. Thousands of people at a buck a shot? How can it be not much? overhead. Rob slumped back in his seat. You've got more than $10,000, haven't you, Artie? Artie looked vague. In fact, he knew himself to be well over the $16,000 mark. They made Denver a little afternoon on Tuesday, checked in at the trailer camp just outside of town, and began their stay, as had become their custom with the walking tour of the downtown area. There was some brief excitement when Artie disappeared, but Rob caught up with him a few minutes later in a nearby bank, converting the spoils of the no-frills milk store into larger, more portable bills. Then the tour continued and everyone relaxed. That was a mistake, because 15 minutes later, Artie was gone for real. How could he have gone, Rob protested. We were all together. I don't know, shrugged Dennis. He was just walking with us, reading through his newspaper, and suddenly he wasn't there anymore. He must have something to do, decided Nick. He's a pretty important guy, you know. Rob groaned. What are we going to do now, he asked. The Twister Pretzel Factory, located in the Denver suburb of Glendale, was a large gray brick building that looked all but deserted. The decision to close up the Denver plant had come from the head office in New York on Friday, and as Tuesday wound down toward that final five o'clock, the disheartened workers coming off the last shift were mostly idle, watching the clock. Catherine Finch, secretary to the Denver general manager, was the last employee left in the office area of the factory. She was sitting at a desk in the secretarial pool, sniffling a little into a handkerchief, when what seemed to her to be the company's last visitor, a young boy in a tuxedo, came in through the glass doors. Excuse me, said Artie politely. I'd like to see whoever's in charge here. Miss Finch shook her, sa her head sadly. No one's in charge, she said, indicating the vacant office suites with a flutter of her handkerchief. They've all gone. There's just me, maybe 10 or 11 men in the plant. She looked at the clock, and in five minutes, we'll be gone too. Well, in that case, said Artie, you're in charge. Would you ask the men to come up here for a moment, please? I have a business proposition. She stared. You? I mean, uh, she hit an intercom button. Joe, could you please bring everyone up here? What for? came a voice. She looked at Artie. Uh, you'll have to see for yourself. A few moments later, the foreman, followed by ten plant workers, entered the office and stared at Artie. Hello, gentlemen, he said. 
I'll get right to the point. Do any of you have plans for the immediate future? There was an uncomfortable silence. Fine, said Artie. Management has no for further use for this building, and they've left it up to you to close up. I understand. I would like to delay that closing until Saturday and keep you all on until that time. There was a chorus of voices. You? Joe the foreman spoke up. Kid, I'm sure you can understand that we've got no sense of humor today, so you better not be joking. What exactly is there in up for us in this plan of yours? In exchange for your services today, tomorrow, Thursday, and all day and all night Friday, I'm prepared to pay you each one and a half times your normal week's pay. There was an interested murmur among the employees. Joe spoke again. Forgive me for being skeptical, kid, but why should we believe you can pay us? Sorry, said Artie. I forgot to mention the terms of payment. Half in cash, right now, on your signature, saying you'll work for me. And the other half, also in cash, on Friday night. Oh, and one more thing. Your jobs will extend from running the factory to helping with incoming material to painting and even dusting and sweeping up. We're a small operation, so you'll have to do whatever needs to be done. You're all-purpose workers now. Are you with me? There was a strained silence. Well, Artie went on, I have the contracts and the money in my case. I await your decision. He walked into a plush private office and sat down at the desk. The group murmured together for a while, and then Joe led the procession into the office. Okay, I've talked it over with Miss Finch and the men, and we're just crazy enough to go along with you. Uh, what do we call you? I mean, you're the boss and all that. Artie shrugged. Doesn't matter. Call me Artie. That'll do. But don't give that name to anyone. We're A. That's all. Just the letter A. And what we're doing here is top secret. That's another part of the deal. Okay, said Miss Finch. But before we sign, I think I speak for everyone here when I ask just what all this is for. Artie smiled. Well, you're now all employees of the Pretzel, the most chic discotheque in the world. Something's happened to him, moaned Rob as the group sat in the trailer park watching the sun set over the Rocky Mountains. He always comes back. Why didn't he come back this time? Where could he be? Take it easy, Nevin. He'll be back. But Rob could see the dentist, too, was feeling the strain. His partner was glancing at the time constantly and looking toward the entrance gate of the park. Only the campers were unperturbed. They were arm wrestling and finding with some shock that Sheldon was the strongest among them. The poor kid, Rob continued anxiously. It's all my fault. I should have watched him more closely. I should have paid more attention. And now... A nearby payphone rang sharply. I'll get it, called Howie, running to answer it. Hey, wait a minute, said Rob. That's not our call. Howie, no. Hello, said Howie. Oh, sure, just a minute. He held out the receiver. Dennis, it's for you. For me, said Dennis in perplexity. Who knows me in Denver? He walked over and took the receiver from Howie. Hello? Yes? A? Who's A? Oh, you mean Artie. Sure, put him on. By this time, Rob was beside him, wringing his hands in agony. What's going on? Dennis shrugged. Some lady says she's going to connect me to Artie. Oh, hi, Artie. Where are you? Uh-huh. Where is he? cried Rob. No place, Dennis reported. Listen, Artie, when are you coming back? He turned to Rob. He says he'll be gone a couple more days. What? Give me the phone. Artie, what in blazes is going on? Hi, Rob, came Artie's voice. Have you gone insane? Tell us where you are and we'll come pick you up right away. Afraid I can't do that, Rob. What? Why not? I can't spare the time. But don't worry. You go on with your tour of Denver and I'll meet up with you later. Artie, this is crazy. Where will you sleep? I've made arrangements. Say hello to the other guys. Bye. Now wait just a minute, Artie. He turned a white face to Dennis and the rest. He hung up. Boy, said Howie, he must be doing something really important if he can't come back to the ambulance to sleep. 
maybe even more important than cows. Rob held his head. What did I do to deserve this? Maybe you walked under a ladder, suggested Nick. Well, we'll keep a stiff upper lip and carry on, decided Dennis. It's all we can do. We've got to find him, Rob moaned. Can you imagine what Butcher will do to us if we show up in Albuquerque without Artie? Artie glanced around with a critical eye. Sorry, Artie glanced with a critical eye around the pet pretzel plant. Now this, he said to the crew, this is perfect. Good size for a disco. Nice high ceiling. The acoustics could be better, but we can compensate with the sound system. Naturally, we'll have to lose some of the machines in the middle there. Lose them? cried Joe in alarm. Those are eight ton pieces of equipment. They don't lose easy. They'll have to be moved to the side, Artie continued. They're right in the middle of the dance floor. H how are you going to do that? Artie looked at him. You're the foreman. I'm sure you'll work it out. Now, I like the general look of this place. He began to walk through the building, his crew of 11 following him. You know, the concrete walls, the pipes, that sort of thing. But it's, it's too dirty and dusty. I want you men to hose down the whole room and repaint the place a glossy black. Got it? Yeah, mumbled Joe. Artie moved over to a section of the factory where a wide conveyor belt cut the corner of the room. Now this part, he said, I like. When we're in business, I want our patrons to be able to come over to this belt and help themselves to a hot, fresh pretzel right out of the oven. By the way, where is the oven? In the next room, said a small man who had been the, chef, the chief baker. Yes, well, I think we should move it out here so our guests can see the whole pretzel making process. Joe sighed. You're the boss, Artie. All this has to be done right away, of course, Artie said. So the paint will be dry when we start the decorating. Oh, and one more thing. He started to move briskly towards the office. When our publicity starts to circulate, we can expect people nosing around. Make sure no one who doesn't have business here gets in. He marched off through the door into the office, then turned and said, The paint should be here already and disappeared into the office, calling, Miss Finch. She looked up from her desk. Yes, Artie? I'd like you to go to the telegraph office for me, please. From his pocket, he produced a long list of names and addresses. Send the following telegram to this list of people. You are invited to the pretzel, Friday, July 27th, 10.30 p.m. Dress optional, 5000 Gregor Avenue, Glendale, 303 555-5000. Sign it A. Denver. Will do, said Miss French. She stared at the list. But, Artie, these are all famous movie stars. Oh no, said Artie. There are also a few astronauts, sports figures, film directors, novelists, and the odd politician. She looked at him wide-eyed. And you think they'll come to the pretzel? Yes, said Artie. Some of them will. Now, that, uh, now has that shipment come in yet from the printer? Uh, no, not yet. It, it should be here in a couple of hours. They've called twice, though, asking about payment. Cash on delivery, as agreed, said Artie. He opened his briefcase and counted out five $100 bills for the telegrams. They're a priority. But before you do that, I want you to make one call for me. We have 20,000 small leaflets that I would like dropped over the city twice daily between now and Friday afternoon. Try the traffic copter pilot on the local radio station. Obviously, his boss doesn't have to know what he's doing for us. Offer him $250, settle for $300. Oh, and throw in an invitation to our grand opening Friday night, okay? She looked at him in admiration. Okay, I'll do my best. On Wednesday morning, the Denver Post contained six strange little ads in various strategic sections of the paper. The ads were black, with white writing, and all read the same. If you're not at the pretzel, you're nowhere. There was a stark expanse of black for a full two and a half inches of the four-inch ad, and then a small white pretzel, and under it, the pretzel opens July 27th. 5000 Gregor Avenue, Glendale, Colorado, 
At the bottom right hand corner, almost imperceptible because of the ad size, were the words presented by A. During the afternoon rush hour, thousands of handbills dropped mysteriously from the sky over downtown Denver. These were in the standard pretzel format, only this time the slogan read, Heaven Sent. The pretzel staff of 12 was delighted with the publicity. It gave them a feeling of importance, with just a touch of conspiracy, and inspired them to work long past quitting time to finish the day's all-important tasks. At noon that day, Joe and his workers escorted Artie into the plant to survey the progress to date. The solvent smell of paint was pungent, but the entire room was now a rich, shiny black, and the offending pieces of machinery had been moved against the walls. A dough mixer, a pretzel shaper, and an oven had appeared at the head of the conveyor belt, so the entire pretzel-making process would be visible. The men looked on anxiously as Artie surveyed the room. Finally, he nodded and said, I like it. There was an audible sigh of relief and pleasure from the crew. That afternoon, Artie placed another telephone call to his hysterical counselors, saying that he was okay but still tied up and would not be available until Saturday morning. Ambulance group was holding up pretty well under the circumstances, except that Rob was losing his ability to function. The sleepless nights and worried days were, talking, were taking their toll on him, and he had developed the involuntary habit of looking around corners and down alleys, up stairways and indoors in the hope that Artie might be there. Dennis was worried about Artie too, but refused to allow it to ruin his stay in Denver. If the boys were worried about it, if the boys were worried about anyone, it was not Artie, but Rob. They were attempting to distract and entertain him at all times, and were succeeding only in aggravating him further. Rob's concerns were threefold. First, a fear that Butcher would show up and take a headcount of ambulance group. Second, an anxiety that something might happen to Artie. And third, a gut feeling that nothing would happen to Artie, and he would be successful in whatever he was doing, thus bringing calamity down on all their heads. The world had become a very hazy place for Rob. Only one thing was clear. Had he elected to stay home and paint houses in suburban Montreal, he would definitely not have to worry about such things. It was a slow day in the spectacular career of Malcolm Lloyd, star of stage, screen, and television. The slowest he could remember since his starring role in the film Confessions of a Closet Philatelist. Philatelist? We'll call it philatelist. That's a funny word. Right. It was the slowest he could remember since his starring role in the film Confessions of a Closet Philatelist had vaulted him to stardom. No one wanted to interview him or photograph his famous face. No one was offering him any new parts in any films. No one even wanted him to endorse a new shampoo. Nothing. But what was this bizarre invitation he had just received? You were invited to the pretzel. What's the pretzel? Interested, he reached for his phone. I'm sorry, Mr. Lloyd, but I can't connect you to the boss, said Miss Finch, her heart fluttering at the sound of his famous voice. No, Mr. Lloyd, he's not taking any calls. No, I don't think he's going to be taking any calls later either. You see, he's very busy. No, sir, I'm afraid I can't tell you who the boss is. Oh, yes, sir, we, we know who you are. Yes, sir, that I can say. We like to call it a disco with a twist. Well, so many other people from the entertainment industry are invited that an actor of your stature certainly warrants an invitation. Oh, I'm not at liberty to say, sir. Well, Mr. Lloyd, if there's any further information you may need, Please don't hesitate to call. She hung up the phone and turned to Artie. How did I do? Fine, said Artie with a slight smile. The wheels were in motion. The first thing Malcolm Lloyd did after getting off the line with Miss Finch was to telephone a friend of his who worked at Channel 7 in Denver. What's all this pretzel stuff, Jerry? What is it? Nobody's sure, was the reply. We didn't hear about it until this morning when all those flyers and ads suddenly appeared. So now everybody knows about the pretzel, but nobody knows what it is. The girl I talked to said it was some kind of disco, said Lloyd. 
that was news to Jerry. The six o'clock report on Channel 7 aired a feature on the pretzel, Denver's hottest and most mysterious disco, hinting broadly that many celebrities, including Hollywood's Malcolm Lloyd, could be expected to attend the opening on Friday. Their camera crew had actually attempted to get inside the factory, but Burly Joe and several of his men had refused them admittance under threat of physical violence, if necessary. By Thursday morning, the phones were ringing the walls down at the office of the pretzel. Artie steadfastly refused interviews and had the desperate pleas for, pleas for any information answered with, we're a disco, with a twist. As more advertisements appeared around the city, more flyers fell from the sky, more reporting teams combed Denver for the slightest clue, and more famous personalities telephoned for information. Artie was supervising the establishment of a massive portable dance floor in the center of his disco. All 11 of his men formed a human barrier to keep out members of the press as the truck backed in the open bay doors of the factory. When it left, similar measures were taken. Miss Finch was in a fervor of excitement. She was speaking with celebrities from all walks of life and had to tell most of them, nicely and apologetically, that they could not be put through to her mysterious boss because he was much too busy. Late Thursday afternoon, a large truck arrived at the pretzel carrying what was claimed to be the loudest sound system in Denver. While Artie's crew was installing it, Artie instructed Miss Finch to phone around the city and rent every piece of lighting equipment available. Rent it all, he advised. Anything you can get your hands on. Lots of color, please, and plenty of flash and mirrors. All the mirrors you can find. I've got to make some more arrangements. I'll be in again in a couple of hours. Is my tuxedo back from the cleaners? Yes, it's in the closet in your office with the new shirt you asked for. She couldn't resist adding. Make sure you take all the pins out, dear. That evening, Joe, accompanied by Artie, paid visits to the four most popular bars in Denver's downtown hub. With Artie waiting in the car, Joe offered each of the four owners the opportunity to, make, to handle some of the drinks on Friday night at the pretzel. Once he had adequately convinced them that he really was a representative of the now legendary pretzel, all agreed eagerly. The deal was that the pretzel would have four bar stations, all privately owned and independent of each other. Each would have to bring his own bar supplies, except for napkins, which already was having printed, and would pay the pretzel 20% of all revenues. The pretzel also reserved the right to set prices for all four bar stations. On Friday night, a regular drink would tip the scale at $7. A similar arrangement was made with a small downtown restaurant called Tilly's, which would be serving food to the patrons of the pretzel. This was to be kept simple, restricted to either an assortment of cheese board or small tray of canapes. Artie and Joe returned to the pretzel factory just in time to see a crew taking down the old sign and replacing it with a new one. Modeled after Artie's ad campaign, the sign featured a black background with an enormous white neon pretzel, under which appeared the relatively small words, the pretzel. Artie entered the factory, walked through the bustling main room, and opened the door to his office. Miss Finch was shouting into the telephone, I don't care how you get it, just so long as you get it. This is for the pretzel, so get a move on. She hit a button, silencing another ringing phone. Pretzel, how may I help you? Ah, yes. On the third page of the Denver Post Friday morning, Artie's customary small ad had grown to take a quarter of the whole sheet. It contained the usual information with the added note, 10.30 tonight, priority to invited guests, admission not guaranteed. Denver was in a tizzy. All three TV stations had camera crews staked out at the airport to catch the movie stars and celebrities arriving on every flight. The pretzel was on everyone's lips. The Rocky Mountain News called it the most exciting event in the last 25 years. The Post predicted a monstrous turnout for opening night. At one o'clock in the afternoon, Artie was called in to inspect his disco. Everything was in place, and the bar and food stations were being assembled and stocked by their individual owners. Joe could barely conceal his pride of accomplishment. Well? Artie looked around critically. I like it. A lot. 
he said finally. The crew glowed. Artie walked into the office area where two more of his men were setting up the DJ's booth. Spying her boss, Miss Finch got up and walked over to him, wringing her hands. Oh, Artie, we've all worked so hard for this. I'm so nervous. Aren't you? Artie looked surprised. No. This is a lost cause, announced Sam in disgust as the ambulance cruised the streets of the city center for the umpteenth time. We're never going to find him this way for the... I mean... We're never going to find him this way. I mean, I don't want to be antisocial, but I'm bored and tired. And no offense, Shell, but I don't want to hear any more about Pete Ogrodnik's sprained ankle. I don't even know the guy. Why don't we either decide to do something and do it, or decide to do nothing and go to sleep? We are doing something, said Rob, with determination. We're looking for Artie. You know, Nevin, Sam's right, said Dennis. Besides, Artie said he'd be with us tomorrow, and he's never let us down before. Oh, spare me, said Rob. Why would he have to say... Well, why would he have to stay today and not be able to leave until tomorrow? What's so important about today? Well, it's the day I went nuts sitting in a van, muttered Sam sourly. I don't think we looked hard enough for a planetarium, Howie complained. Well, at least one good thing came out of it, said Dennis. I managed to grab this great flyer from my room. Free, too. I took it right off a fence. He held up the flyer for all to admire. It's one of those pretzel ads. Isn't it a beauty? He sighed. The grand opening's tonight. They've got all kinds of celebrities coming. I wish we could go there. Oh, sure, said Rob. Go dance the night away. We haven't got a worry in the world. Dennis was still staring at the flyer as though transfixed. Imagine being in Denver tonight and missing out on the pretzel. It must be some slick operation. Grand opening tonight presented by A. A. Hmm. That's strange. A. Uh-oh. Rob, you don't suppose. The screech of tires cut the air as Rob slammed on the brakes. What? What did you say? Well, I don't know exactly, but no one had ever heard of the pretzel until we got to Denver. And the grand opening is tonight, and it's presented by A, and I don't know. It, it could never happen, but... That's Artie, exclaimed Sam in, in admiration. What a guy. And in our group yet. Artie is the pretzel, asked Kevin in disbelief. Let's go, shouted Rob, pulling into a lane and turning the van around. Where? The pretzel. We're going to crash a party. With Dennis navigating, ambulance group headed for the suburban, the suburb of Glendale and the world's most cheek disco. From three blocks down the street, the great neon pretzel shone out of the darkness, looking as though it hung unsupported in the air, a disoriented electric eel chasing its tail. In anticipation of great traffic problems, the city of Denver had sent two traffic officers to keep things moving. Taxis, private cars, and rented limousines were everywhere, and the small factory parking lot filled up almost immediately. Dennis and Rob were waved past and had to settle for a parking spot a half a mile away from the pretzel. Even at that distance, they could hear the music. They finally arrived at the mirrored door a little after 11. There was an enormous lineup extending down the block and around the corner. If there was any doubt in Rob's mind that this was the brainchild of Artie Geller, it was dispelled by the sign. Cover charge, $24. No coins, please. At the entrance stood a doorman in a red uniform with gold braid and tassel. Behind him sat a large, muscular man who was collecting money and overseeing the admission process. When the ambulance group got to the door, the doorman was welcoming the glamorous Fifi Latour, star of TV's hit comedy series Mademoiselle Schwartz. She was escorted by astronaut Troy Stratos, who was famous not so much for the dubious distinction of having been the 43rd man to orbit the Earth, as for his renown as an international playboy. Rob tried to walk in the door, but the seated man, Joe, put an iron grip on his arm. The doorman fixed Rob with a long-nosed stare and snorted with disdain. He said, How kind of you, sir! to save me the trouble of admitting all of these other fine people before the obvious pleasure of admitting you. Truly noble, 
but I fear I must decline. Please, go to the end of the line. You can't miss it. You merely follow this queue of people until there aren't any more. And then you stand there. But you don't understand, said Rob. I've got to see Artie Geller. The seated man stood up. What business have you got with the boss, he asked gruffly. He's one of the ambulance group, piped Sam. Just tell him Dennis and Rob are here to see him, said Dennis. The big man beckoned a replacement over and disappeared inside the building for a few minutes. When he returned, he was looking more kindly. All right, you and your party, follow me. The step through the door from the outside world into the pretzel was a step into another dimension. The music was deafening its heavy beat and bass notes jarring the senses, its wailing highs assaulting the mind. The pretzel was not merely a room, it was light and color at their acrobatic best. Hundreds of lights mounted on the ceiling and walls, and even on the dance floor flashed, blazed, waved, and shimmered, and the mirrors played them back a hundredfold. The disco was already mobbed. Rob could not help wondering what it would be like when the people in line outside were all admitted. The dance floor was thick with gyrating bodies moving in harmony with the lights and sound. All the chairs and tables were occupied, and the bar stations and food center were operating at capacity. In one corner, two bakers were filling a machine with salted dough, and a few yards away, an enormous crowd of people joyously snatched hot pretzels from a conveyor belt. The air was heavy with smoke and the smell of freshly baked dough. Ambulance group was led out of the disco and into a suite of offices. There, behind a large, polished mahogany desk, reclining in a padded swivel chair, and munching contentedly on a hot pretzel, sat Artie in full business regalia. Rob saw red. Artie, what is this? Howie nudged him. Psst, Rob, it's a disco. I know it's a disco. What I want to know is where that little crook gets the nerve, the sheer, unadulterated nerve to... The big man who had brought them in turned on Rob. Hey, you! Show some respect. Don't you know who you're talking to? Yes, I know exactly who I'm talking to. I'm talking to Artie Geller, an 11-year-old runaway from Junior Tours. That's who I'm talking to. Miss Finch looked at Artie. Is that true? Artie shrugged. A man appeared in the doorway. Artie, our, our count's at 1,800, but I think we can fit a lot more in. Go to it, said Artie. The man disappeared. Wow, breathed Kevin. 1,800 people times $2,400. That's $43,200. Is it? said Artie, mildly. I never was much at math. Dennis spoke up. Well, look, Artie, we, we think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful place you have here, and, and we're very proud of you for doing all this, but we really have to... His voice trailed off as a strange-looking man dressed entirely in metallic blue danced his way into the office. <gasps> oh, gasped Dennis. You're... you're... He snapped his fingers. Mike Banshee, the lead singer of Sheep Dip? Yeah, man. I just wanted to tell the little boss here that this is truly a cosmic place he's running. He turned to Artie. My man, this place has vibes. It's like the 4th of July H-bomb reality kaleidoscope big. It is, was, and will be. Man, and I say that with all mega sincerity. Artie smiled politely. I'm glad you're having a good time, Mr. Banshee. Oh, can I have your autograph, Dennis begged? I have all your albums. The apparition in blue scribbled something on a piece of paper from Artie's desk and danced back into the disco. All right, Artie, said Rob. Let's get going. Dennis looked at Rob as though he were completely insane. We can't leave. It's the chance of a lifetime. There are important people out there. You'll be staying, of course, said Artie. Oh, can we? The five boys charged up to Artie's desk and began slapping him on the back in a great show of brotherhood. We can't stay, argued Rob. We can't afford to sniff the air out there. My people, said Artie, don't pay. He scribbled a note on a piece of paper and handed it to Dennis. This is good for anything you need. Have a good time. Dennis was beside himself with pleasure. Artie, you're a prince. 
Aren't you going to come with us? asked Sheldon. Oh no, said Artie. I'm working. A staff member walked in and placed a carton full of money on the desk. Plenty more where that came from, boss. Artie reached for his calculator. Come on, Rob, called Dennis. The whole world's out there. Rob looked tempted. Artie, I want your word that as soon as this is over, we all drive to New Mexico. If we go all night, we can make it and only be a few hours late. Artie nodded. You have my word. And that is the end of chapter eight. Well, we will take a break for the weekend, as usual, and come back next week for chapter nine. We are getting fairly close to the end here. We got hmm, 11 chapters. Okay, so chapter nine next week called A Little Difference of Opinion. But until then, as you know, it's late, and I'm tired, and so it's time to get some sleep. Good night.